Fantastic. Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining me and Steve for this very first live stream Sing September event. It's great, great to see you all. I'm delighted, as I said this evening, to be joined by Steve Scott. Steve is currently the music education specialist for the Barbershop Harmony Society, as well as a voice teacher, coach and judge. Steve will be giving us the presentation on foundational vocal principles and will then be answering any questions from you all. If you would like to ask anything, then please post your questions in the comments on the live feed and we'll try to get them all answered. Thank you so much for joining us this evening, Steve. My pleasure. I'm happy to be here. Good evening, Great everybody. <laughs> well, we are all delighted to see you and I am now going to hand over to you and I will see you all again very shortly. Great. I assume that there are just thousands and thousands of people on this talk. I'm so glad that you all are here. Thanks for coming on this journey with me. Let me share my screen and my presentation. Everybody sees that okay? Uh, let me know if you don't. Uh, as was said, I'm, I'm Steve and I work for the BHS and I have been a barber shopper for almost 30 years now, getting close to 30 years, and it's been a wonderful journey. I've also been a public school teacher, I've been a professor, I've been a traveling voice teacher, and I love it all. I have been on quite the journey. And one of the reasons why I like giving this talk is because I get to start off with a little bit of honesty. It's taken me a long time to actually care about my voice, to actually love my voice. I'm sure that some of you can relate. There are days where you just absolutely love what's going on. And then there are days where it's like, I hate everything about it and I want to, you know, give up. But uh, I can tell you after most of my life of frustration with some joys and some guides along the way, good and bad. And uh, I finally come to a deeper understanding of the singing process and I think a little bit of myself as well. One of the foundational understandings that I've discovered is how relatively easy and simple the singing process is, but how often we humans muck it up. I, I say that with all the love in my heart. We are well-intended, loving human beings, and uh, we can only convey what we think we know. As we come to understand this principle of, of singing uh, a little bit more deeply and a little bit more uh, realistically, then I think our experience personally becomes a little bit better And as we participate in ensemble singing like with Sound and Barbershop. So today I want to share the basic basics of singing process and how that understanding can help you unlock your own instrument and realize how powerful it is. I want to start by talking about our very first singing experiences when we are in a church choir or a school choir or a civic choir. Think about those first moments that you had as a singer. Uh, I'm almost positive that some of those very first singing experiences you had, that well-intended instructor asked you to change what you were doing in some way. They wanted you to manipulate your instrument. And those manipulations could have taken a variety of forms. Uh, usually it's in the form of a breath instruction, like a bigger breath, or you should be breathing up and in, or you should be breathing down and out. You should be breathing all around. You should be don't forget about the back, back breathing, and definitely no shoulders, right? No cl clavicle, none of that stuff. No, shouldn't see any movement there. Sometimes we receive instruction on ways to change our resonance. We should be thinking like that we should be singing in a domed feeling back here. We should have lift. There are probably mentions of palates or smiling on the inside perhaps directing the, the stream of sound, all of those different ways to get us to manipulate our natural phonation process. So why do you think that is? I think perhaps it's we are, we teach how we were taught. It's not a bad thing per se, it's just that's how we have received information. As we get a little bit more mastery over the subject, however, that involves a lot of research, we tend to stop using what other people have taught us and develop our own way of, of teaching. And when we do that, 
we're relying a little bit more on, on facts instead of experiential data. I think a lot of the way, reasons we were taught to sing has to do with the places in which historically singing occurred. If you think about it, at least in Western music, most singing was associated with a religious service of some kind. And those religious services often took places in venues that were highly echoic. And when you're singing in those highly echoic spaces in a group, uh, the natural vibrancy of the human voice can be a little bit overwhelming. So if this is my regular singing voice, this is my regular singing voice, I have to, I have to take some of that upper overtone out so I can not have that be so vibrant. And if I put it back in, then all of a sudden it's too bright, especially if you times that by 40 or 50 people, or even 10 or 12 people, that can become very live in a, an acoustic setting that's very wet. So I, my supposition is that we were taught it, when we're singing in those spaces to manipulate our sound to take out some of those live, more live overtones in the naturally occurring human voice, for singing, and that's just what we perpetuated over the centuries of singing, and that's what we generally associate with singing, is that kind of churchy choral sound. Not to say that it's bad, because it works very well in those venues, but barbershop doesn't usually sing in those venues. Barbershop, in fact, is a vernacular parlor style of singing. It's, it's meant to be sung in front rooms and living rooms, and we, when we don't sing in those places, we tend to sing with microphones and amplification systems. So the requirements of that choral, more formal type of singing in those highly echoic chambers is not necessarily our day-to-day -day experience when singing in barbershop ensembles. If you ever hear non-Western music, they don't have that same sort of preoccupation with you know, those uh, manipulations that we have in our Western style of singing. So I want you to reimagine singing a little bit. Singing is a process that is very simple. It's just phonation. And I'm going to use that word a lot today, phonation. Phonation is any time you use your voice. That's speaking, singing, grunting, growling, squawking, crying, moaning, wailing, gnashing, squawking. Did I say squawking already? Calling, all those different types of ways to use our voice. It's all phonation. So physiologically speaking, most of they are produced in the same way. The vocal folds come together, they vibrate, the same cartilages, the same uh, neural pathway, it's all produced the same way. There are slight uh, recipe changes for those uh, involving different timbres after it's uh, produced, but the way that it's produced is the same. So in the most non-offensively way possible, I want you to, to stop thinking that singing is special. And I'm talking just in terms of how it's produced. It's not terribly different than what you've done all of your life with your voice. So think of your voice as an instrument, whether it's speaking or singing or whatever it is, it's, it's an instrument and it has a power supply. It has a vibratory source. It has a resonating chamber and it has articulatory sources. The trumpet has a air supply with uh, air coming from the lungs, vibrating lips on a mouthpiece, and then it goes through tubing. A violin has the force of the bow, uh, the vibrating strings, and the actual body of the violin as its resonating chamber. Just like those instruments, we are an instrument. And just like uh, those instruments, we can, that's, that's, how we, that's how we create sound. And that's kind of what I wanna talk about in terms of making, making singing understood in a very plain sense. Now I have to do a little bit of talk about uh, some science stuff here. So um, the way that we produce the sound is uh, that we receive a signal sent from the brain to the muscles to close. And then underneath those closed vocal folds, there's a buildup of air as air is trying to leave those lungs. And when that air pressure becomes too great for those vocal folds to handle anymore, they they burst open. And after they've burst open, sound gets propagated on that little burst of air. There's now a, a drop in pressure between those vocal folds and those vocal folds get sucked back together. And then once those vocal folds get sucked back together, the air builds up underneath it again. And so it's just constant uh, bursting and, and sucking back together. Uh, this 
this picture kind of describes a little bit. Let me let me stop this and go to a website real quick to hopefully demonstrate my point just a little bit better. Hopefully you can see this. Let me share that screen again. Nope, that was my PowerPoint. That's not what I wanted to do. I have done this before a lot. You think I'd be better at it? Google Chrome, here we go. All right, so pay no attention to the singing, I guess, but this, this website from Columbia University kind of shows what the phonation process is like. Air gathers underneath the vocal folds until the pressure becomes too great and it bursts the vocal folds open and then sound carries on through. So check this out. That's it. That's how sound is created. These are the vocal folds right here. This is air being kind of gathered until the pressure of the vocal folds is uh, underneath the vocal folds is too great and then it, and it bursts out. That's, that's kind of it, friends. We, we tend to complicate this process and make it a little bit more exciting or mysterious or, or whatever than it actually is. And it's, it's just that. The sound gets perpetuated on those airs, on that air. So when we talk about efficiency of phonation, uh, when we're talking about phonation, I want you to think about it in terms of efficiency. Efficient tone is created when the vocal folds come together and the air is, is pressure begins to build. And then as soon as it is uh, met, the vocal folds burst open and that's, that's how sound is created. But there, that's efficient phonation. Inefficient phonation is when the vocal folds don't close all the way. And so as air is building up underneath it, air is also escaping through the vocal folds that are parted. And so they don't get quite the same burst of sound. Breathy sounding, sounding singing is what happens when the phonation is inefficient in that way. You can hear the breathiness of the tone and the tone isn't as strong or as loud perceptively because there's not the same sort of uh, burst in, of the sound. Also a different way of thinking about uh, inefficient tone is, oops, is thinking about when tone is, when those vocal folds get pressed a little bit too hard together, the, the vocal fold muscles are engaged a little bit too hard, and then the air pressure builds up so much that when it has to burst, you hear that kind of uh, sound to start. That's what we call press singing, or you can, you can even think of it as a kind of a glottal attack, but if it's carried throughout the phrase, then it's, it's going to result in, in pressed phonation. The reason why that this is important is because it is highly, highly specific for us as singers because singing involves more pitch variations than speaking, speaking does. We never really think about the breath that we take for speaking, we just do. We phone it all day long. We grunt and cry and squawk and yell at the dog and all that stuff. And it's, we don't ever think about it, we just do. But then we start to really get thinking about it, about breathing for singing. I think that we, again, think about it that way just because of how we were taught. And, it's, and I think that we also think because there's so many variations in, in what we do from singing that uh, it has to be treated a little bit more special. And it does, but not in the way that you probably are thinking. So when you think about the pitches that we create, I want you to think about it as a rubber band. The longer our, the, when our vocal folds get stretched and thin out, it gives us a pitch change. I don't know if you can hear this. This is a, a hair tie that I found. Bump, 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 bump. But as I stretch it, bump, 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 bump. So the longer and thinner these strings become, the higher in pitch it goes. The same thing happens with our voice. As we ascend in pitch, our vocal folds stretch and they thin out. What we don't ever really think about though is that our capacity to withstand air pressure also decreases because now we don't have thick vocal folds keeping back all that air pressure that's been gathering underneath those vocal folds. So the higher in pitch our vocal our, the higher in pitch we are, the thinner our vocal folds go, the less capacity we have to keep back that air pressure. So the higher we sing, the less air we need. Otherwise, we're gonna get one of those inefficient vocal fold closures, which we were calling breathy because our vocal folds aren't closed all the way or pressed because we're, our body's doing such a, a job to keep our vocal folds closed. 
after we've created the sound here at the vocal folds, it then travels up through the back of the throat and out the mouth. This area here is called the vocal tract. And that as it goes through the vocal tract, our, our sound gets Re, it gets changed, it gets amplified and dampened based on the configurations of our vocal tract. And we can change the size and the shape of our vocal tract just by changing our tongue position. So for example, if I say, hey, 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 who, 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 he, 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 my tongue is changing different positions every time I create a vowel and it changes the way that my sound is resounded or the way that the different parts of those uh, overtones that I naturally create get amplified or dampened. Remember that a lot of our vocal instruction is based on singing that was done in highly echoic chambers. And that natural efficiency of the, of the speaking voice, all those upper strong partials in our voice, those kind of became too much for those spaces uh, that would call for active manipulation of our, of our vocal tract. So my advice on this call is to avoid instructions uh, that ask you to manipulate your body in such a way that is based on outdated sound models, right? We don't sing in those chambers. We don't need to manipulate our sound in that way. Barbershop, again, I'll, I'll, I'll stress is a vernacular style of singing. Our intent is to tell stories, is to entertain, is to have meaningful experiences with our audience members. And we can't do that if we're constantly trying to manipulate. I joined the Barbershop Harmony Society in an era where everything was done where we were creating our vowels in this way. Let me call you sweetheart, I'm in love with you. That's how we were taught to sing at that time that has a very specific look to it and it has a very different sound to it as well. And it can be confusing to a lot of people that type of instruction. I'm gonna suggest that most of the, the choral types of instructions that you receive perhaps are not necessary for this style of singing, particularly if you're singing in a, in a room or you're singing in a, in a big room or auditorium or performance venue that has microphones. We don't need to sing like that. We don't need to dampen any of our overtones to be singing like that. In fact, one of the goals of Barbershop particularly is to get what we call expanded sound. We've called this a number of things in the past. We've called it lock and ring or whatever have you, but the actual term that is used is expanded sound. That's why we like singing Barbershop is when we get four voices or, or parts singing in such a way that we hear audible uh, outside tones. And those tones are done when we reinforce the vowels uh, of the, the singers around us. And we can't, we can't do that if we're actively manipulating. Anytime we manipulate our vowels, we are going to, or any type we, type we, time we manipulate our singing, it's gonna be harder to, to find that expansion. So we don't necessarily need that lift in barbershop because that lift creates a, a vocal tract configuration that is, is, is different than our, our everyday experience. When I think of lift, when, when you think of lift, usually what happens is that you go, and I don't know if you can see, but my larynx went way down. When I think of lift, or when I think of lifting my soft palate, my larynx goes down, my, my tube gets longer. And so yes, then I sing like this, let me call. So that has a lot of what you might call lift in it or space or whatever, a lot of length, but it has again dampened overtones because I've manipulated that sound. My larynx is already in a neutral position. And that neutral position has a lot of depth in it already. And it has a lot of brightness in it already. I can make my sound quote unquote brighter, let me call. I actually didn't change my vowels at all. I raised my larynx, let me call, let me call, let me call. When I manipulate my sound that way, I get different types of resonance. And that's just me changing my, my larynx height, manipulating it uh, from a neutral position to an actively high position to an actively low position. All of those give us different uh, sound variations. Now, 
sometimes that is exactly what you are looking for in the song that you're singing. Usually those are for an effect of some kind. Those aren't long-term singing objectives because, well, what story are you telling? Uh, maybe it is, but probably not. We use those for momentary effect. And effective performers, those quartets and choruses that are scoring at the highest of our contests or are putting on the most compelling of performances uh, for the public are ones that manipulate uh, the least and are the most genuine storytellers using the variety of vocal colors they have at their express uh, at their at their disposal. Your body knows instinctually what to do. How do, how do we sing high? Well, our, we, we access those pitches all the time. We don't necessarily recognize it, that those are viable ways to access those notes all the time. For example, if I laugh, if I laugh and I'm really laughing high and loud, I go, <laughs> not type, uh, truly a Marty Munson style of laugh, but if, I, if I'm really going after it, I'm laughing. <laughs> what pitch is that? That's super high. If I were to see that note on a page, I would freak out about singing that high of a note, but I can laugh that high. And we, we yell at the, the referees or we, we yell at the television or we yell at the traffic and say, oh man, come on. How high is that? Hmm, hmm, oh man, come on. That's not falsetto. That's just me phonating that high. Male, female, in between, it doesn't matter what, what your gender is. You, you access those high parts of your body, the, of your range all the time and your body knows what to do and how to do it. That's how we've been successful communicators all our lives. And so what I'm trying to tell you is that you have the capacity to use those when you need to. So when I did all of my university training and I came back to sing barbershop and I sang the, the tag to uh, let me call you sweetheart. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, you are by my God. Sweet and lovely. I went, you are by my side. Took a big breath. Side. That big breath creates a problem. That big mouth space creates a problem. That dampened uh, vowel creates a problem because I'm not using anything that sounds like genuine communication. And if our objective is to be genuine communicators with our audience, we have to be the least manipulative on the block. So this is my regular, and this is my speaking voice. You are by my side, you are by my side, you are by my side. So when I manipulate, I overdo it, side. That's how I say the word side. You might say it differently where you're from, and that's fine. Side is how I say it, and that's how I should sing it as well. Get back to that in just a second. Your body knows what to do to be effective in storytelling. How do you sing sweetly? Well, you know how to speak sweetly. You know how to uh, be robust. You know how to be engaging. You know how to charge up a crowd, even if it's fake. You know how to do that. You know how to speak in that way to generate that effect. It's the same for singing. It's no different. How do those guys or how do those girls or how does that quartet, how, how does that ensemble sing so compellingly? Well, they've figured out that they've let the body take over and do what it knows what to do. You don't have to change who you are to do all these things. You do them already. As long as you aren't giving it a bunch of other commands at the same time. Hey, sing so, so powerfully, sing so robustly, but also do all these other things too. That's a bunch of different commands. Your body doesn't know what to do with all that stuff. And in fact, you're gonna create a more challenging experience for yourself and probably more frustrating. That was my experience growing up. All, all the years of undergraduate voice lessons and choral singing experiences and graduate voice lessons and uh, more graduate voice lessons, just thinking that I had to do all these things to make my voice like this. It's already powerful. It's already big. It's already wonderful. It's already expressive. It's just 
letting those other things not manipulate my sound and using what I have effectively. You can do it. It's, it's just phonation. It's not special. It's special in the experiences that we create, but it's not phys physically special. It's the same as everything else we do. So basically, how would you say it? How would you convey this text that you're going to sing in a, in, in a convincing way to another human being? In a non-singing context, how would you say these words to another human being to get whatever the objective is, whether it's to, get them to fall in love with you, to get them to stay, to get them to be, uh, to understand how sad you are, to get them to be excited about what's going to happen, or to get them to really enjoy jazz, or whatever it is that you're singing about, how would you say that to another person to get the super objective? You, you know how to do that, speaking. If anybody have ever talked, if anybody have ever read to a child, you know how to do all the voices to make that story sound exciting. I have a, a son who's almost two years old and we do all the voices when we read books together. You, you do that already too. You didn't know that that is something that you can use in your singing experience. So find the most efficient way to make those sounds, particularly if those are sounds are in a, in a high register. That might entail you abandoning what you have traditionally associated with singing. For example, uh, when the first time I heard Crossroads sing, you don't, you won't. And I was looking at the sheet music at the same time and I was thinking, how is it possible that Mike Slamka is singing that high, that successfully without any sort of like stuff going on? Because that has never been my experience singing up at the top of the staff without any sort of like eh, happening at the same time. I marveled at that and I just blew it off. And I was like, oh, he's, he's clearly, he's clearly uh, built in a different way. Look at uh, folks like Tim Warwick and think, oh my gosh, he must have three lungs or four. He might not be totally human. He's superhuman, he's something extra. Well, these folks, these friends of ours, they have just figured out that all the things that they do naturally with their voice, they've extended into their singing. It's not much more than they already are doing. And you can do it too. Not like in some future state. I'm talking like today, you can do those things. And I think that's the thing that most people are unwilling to let go is that I can't do that. Yes, you can. You can. And it's a matter of you empowering yourself to find those things in your body that you're already producing naturally to, to get whatever your objective is, to sing high, to sing loud, to sing long, whatever it is. You can do it right now. I think that's what's, what's really empowering for me. And again, after 30 years of being a barbershopper and 20 years of studying this thing as, as a student, that's kind of been my experience as well. But Steve, you cry, there are 473 accents just in London alone. Which way of speaking is correct? Because that's what I'm advocating, right? Find what you do in your speaking voice. So which, which accent is correct? Uh, the answer is yes, it is correct. Whatever way you say it is correct. The human ear will accept a number of variations of vowels and still recognize the word. We call those accents. Similarly, we tend to subtly shift the way we speak depending on who we're with or where we are. For example, if you've ever spoken to a child, you automatically modify the timbre of your voice. You, you sometimes modify the thickness of your vocal folds. So you're, you're not speaking with such thick vocal folds. Hey, now these are the same pitches, but now I'm talking to a child. I don't want you to be afraid of my voice, but this is my actual regular voice. And then when you wanna, when you want to really show them that you know what you're talking about, then you thicken up your vocal folds. And if you're speaking to somebody who's educated or somebody who's in government or somebody who's uh, a law person, then we change the way we speak. We change the habits, we change our, our language, all of those things. But we also change where, by where we are. For example, uh, whenever I'm in Canada, I tend to elongate my O's. If I'm ever in New England, I tend to elongate my A's. Uh, if I'm ever in the UK or Australia or New Zealand, I definitely play with the with the accents because they're so delightful and my and I just naturally do that. We we subtly shift our accents all the time. No accent is incorrect, and you can handle a number of changes, and they will be slight. I would suggest you play 
with uh, those, those vowels until you find an ensemble accent. I have found chanting to be the most effective way to get that ensemble accent. Even if with the most varied of people, uh, I was coaching a chorus last year in Australia that had somebody from Germany, somebody from Ireland, somebody from the United States, people from all over Australia, which is an enormous, beautiful country, but they have very varied accents down there as well. And I think there was even a Kiwi in that, uh, that, that chorus. And it's absolutely possible to get to a unified sound despite the varied accents. Chanting is the best way, I think. Let, let me call you, sweetheart. Find how every vowel expands. Let, 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 let me, 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 let me call, 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 let me call, let me call you, sweetheart. There's a number of different vowels in there that will still allow me to expand that, that sound of my own voice. And so we can find that within an ensemble. It's not as tough as you think, and you're not changing as much as you think. So find how each person can personally expand that, that vowel, and then how it works within the ensemble setting. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about some slight adjustments that are more than just what we would do, quote unquote, naturally. I think this ha it has to do with the way that we are basically unnatural in the way that we hold ourselves. I have been talking to you for about half an hour, and I don't know if you've noticed this, but I have been kind of hunched over this entire time because like a dummy, that is my default position. I know that I have neck and back problems and I should probably not sit that way, and when I change my body alignment, can you hear the change in my sound? Just that little change where I came off of my body like this, where it was kind of crushing my larynx and my windpipe. Just changing that one small thing changes my sound completely. So uh, there might be a, an encouragement that your coach or your director might make, and that would be to allow your body to have the least amount of resistance upon it. Um, when you do so, it, it would engage muscles that don't otherwise need to be engaged, also known as tension. When you allow your body to not be as tense, either here in the abdominal region or in the hips, or especially here in the head and the neck region, then you can naturally you, uh, act as an amplifier for your voice. For your vocal sound. All right, I think it's a review. Humans phonate in a variety of ways, speaking, singing, grunting, growling, wailing, moaning, all of that stuff. All of those phonation types are fair game while we sing. Have a care that large scale changes to what your default state is, especially in breathing, can lead to problems in the voice. If you have ever heard of somebody that gets uh, vocal fatigue or uh, heaven forbid, a, 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 have a, they have a, a nodule or a polyp or some other lesion happen to their voice, that is because they have done something very dramatically different than what they tend to do day to day. That has usually to do with the amount of air pressure that they're subjecting their vocal folds to. If you balance the vocal fold, uh, closure and the vocal fold thickness to the pressure that's coming from the lungs, you can sing for hours and not fatigue. But we tend to get in trouble when we over breathe. That's been my experience, not only as a barber shopper of 30 years, but also as a voice teacher for 15 years, one that specifically has studied the biophysiology of barbershop singers. We, friends, overdo it. Again, I'll say that natural changes to the naturalness of our vocal tract, this thing here from the, from the larynx, back of the throat, mouth, all that stuff, that can lead to changes in the, the resonance. And that is fatiguing. I would always get tired right here in this part of my, my voice at the end of rehearsals when I was younger. 
because I was overdoing with my tongue. I was trying to create space. Let me call. I'm engaging this tongue muscle, which is not otherwise engaged when I speak. This muscle is squishy when I speak. Let me call. When I raise my soft palate too high, when I try to get space, when I create something that is extra Steve, that's when I get myself into trouble. And that's what can lead to focal fatigue, which can lead to a larger problem. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that you yourself are powerfully built as an acoustic singing phonating machine. And it's just allowing yourself to recognize that power. What is gonna be, first of all, most effective in a storytelling capacity, and then what makes the most sense in the ensemble in terms of expansion. Find that within yourself and within your ensemble. And that's the funnest singing that we can do in this style. All right, how did I do? We have time for some questions now, right? Absolutely, we do. Yes, and I have a number of questions already in. Thank you so much for that, Steve. That was an absolutely fantastic session. I was enthralled throughout all of it myself, um, actually forgetting to look for questions. So let me just grab them up. Okay, so Pat has asked, I sometimes feel as though my vocal cords are coated in treacle. Any suggestions, please, on how to manage mucus in the vocal tract? Yes, friend, yes. I myself also find myself coated with uh, what the Germans call Schleim. That mucus coating is natural because our vocal folds are first mucus membranes. They are literally the outermost layer is coated in, in a layer of water and mucus. And the less hydrated we are, the thicker that mucosal lining is and the more sticky our vocal folds are. They aren't as pliant, They're, they don't vibrate as freely. You'll probably notice that it might take an hour or two hours to kind of fully vibrate that stuff off of your vocal folds. I know that, that as I'm not taking care of my own hydration levels like I should, I find myself needing that extra time to vibrate that stuff off my vocal folds. So I am the vocal coach for the Music City Chorus here in Nashville, Tennessee. And we have made a very specific and concentrated effort to, to do what I call degunking. And so if you would like, to, we can do a quick degunking training here in front of God and everybody by showing you three ways to vibrate that stuff off your folds and then three ways to eliminate it. So here's the first one. It is just to exhale air and not have any sort of uh, phonation at all. And it's just, I, and I put my hand in front of my face to make sure that I'm getting it right. Just by, couple quick spurts of air. That's one of the ways to kind of shake out that mucus. And then I swallow it. Here's one swallowing way. Let's put my chin to my chest and swallow. I got a big bunch of mucus out with that. Yeah. All right. You can, can you start to hear how my voice is already even now just a little bit clearer? So here's a, a vibratory way number two, and that is to do a little bit of voicing. And that's just to go, <gasps> this is non- Aggressive. And then uh, here's the second way to eliminate it, and that's to bite your tongue and swallow. Yeah, yeah, that good. I'm sure this is what you all signed on to do is watch me get rid of the mucus on my voice. Uh, I can already feel it vibrating a little bit more clearly. A couple more of these and I should be clear. Uh, here's the third way and that's just to do vocal fry. And that's just going something like this. Uh, And then here's the third way to swallow, and that's to press your tongue into the roof of your mouth and swallow slowly. So uh, in the Music City Chorus, we spend, you know, probably half of our warm up getting rid of the mucus on the vocal folds. And we concentrate, you know, the 20, 20, 25 minute warm up, we spend about half of it concentrating on getting the, the rid of that mucus in those ways. And because we do so, we feel like we get an hour of more clear vibrating vocal folds for most of the rehearsal. So first, up your hydration. Up, And when I say hydration, that means that the, the liquids that we drink should be as clear as possible. Not vodka, I mean water. <laughs> Not flavored water, 
water, not water in, infused with other things, just water, he said as he finished off his orange flavored drink. And number two, especially if you're gonna be rehearsing, see how much of that gunk you can get off of your vocal folds before singing with your ensemble by vibrating in those gentle ways and then eliminating it in whatever way was most efficient for you. And then spend time in your rehearsal warm, during the warm-up session, getting rid of that stuff. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Okay, so we have had Danny ask, what warm-ups do you use with choruses to maximize resonance and make vowel matching easier? Great question. I alluded to a little bit in my talk earlier. We spent a lot of time speaking, finding the resonance in the, in the voice, and then before we put it into a singing context with all the moving notes, I, I employ chanting a great deal. I love chanting. Chanting is a way to get us into a singing-like mode, at least mentally, because it's phonotorially, phonotationally, it's the same. Uh, physiologically, and um, it, but it helps kind of train the brain to go, this isn't quite speaking, but it's not quite the, all the singing notes, but it's something in between. So we say it, hey, 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 ha, 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 uh, let, let, let me call, let me call, call, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, don't get the L too soon, let me call, call, you sweetheart, let, let me, let me, let me, let me call, ca, 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 let me call you, sweetheart. And I do that, and I'm making sure that the baritones are doing that. I'm making sure that the entire chorus is doing that. We do it on one pitch to make sure that we are actively in our own voices finding the resonant frequency of that vowel for that pitch as an ensemble until that it is just expanding off of the rafters. And then, after chanting on that one pitch, I have us chant on two pitches. The basses and baritones are here, the leads and tenors are here, or here, on a fourth or a fifth, and I just want us to chant in that way so we're still finding that resonance in those each one of those vowels on one pitch, but we're also doing it in, in, in two different parts so we can kind of hear where one part kind of loses the, the expansion in that vowel or whatever vowel it was. And then I go to four parts, bass, baritone, lead, tenor, or tenor, whatever note floats your boat, uh, whatever type of chord floats your boat, we get a chord going and we're hearing the expansion in all four of those voices and all four of those parts to make sure that every note, every vowel has expansion. I'm not talking press and I'm not talking manipulation. I'm talking that every single person has found within their own self how they maximize that vowel. Sometimes there's a, adjustments and alignment that are needed, but most of the time we can find it just in those types of practices. So we can, we can find it in the speaking voice, we can find it in a unison chant and in a duet chant, and then if we can find it in a chord chant just on one pitch, the next transition to pitches that move up and down shouldn't be dramatically different. And I have found that interjecting that chanting sequence uh, as part of the process has been revelatory and helps us find an accent for the ensemble because of the varied voices. And it helps us, oh, you can do, you can sing an entire song on one pitch as an ensemble and do your breath plan, to do your emotional delivery, to do stage presence. You don't have to keep singing the notes and fatiguing your voice all the time to do all those different things that we still have to do as an ensemble, sing it on one pitch. You can be expressive. You should be able to get through an entire song singing on one note. And at the end, have as much emotional release as you do singing the song on all the varied pitches. That's a challenge. Steve challenges you to do that. So that is a way that I have found to find that unity. So specifically in the chorus, I do, the warm-ups don't necessarily matter in terms of like ba da 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 or ba da 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 ba da da ba da 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 da. None of those really matter. Those sequences aren't as important as the unity is. The unity in the vowel, the unity in the release breath, that we're not overcrowding the vocal folds for those higher pitches, and the unity in in expression. Those are the things that I I focus on. So. Fantastic, thank you very much. Okay, so Tim has asked, can your larynx actually move or is it a feeling of the muscles around it? 
Someone once told him that the larynx can't move as it's anchored in place, but we often talk about lowering the larynx. Well, technically speaking, yes, that's correct. The larynx is fixed in place, but the entire laryngeal housing moves up and down by the, the, the muscles that lift it from the top and there are uh, laryngeal depressors as well. So these muscles attach to the laryngeal housing and pull the whole thing down. Like the larynx, the voice box itself doesn't move, but the whole thing moves. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, Ben has asked, any advice to a new quartetta on how to begin? What should he be listening for doing to make it work? Good question. Well, before we get to any sort of singing, find the songs that you like to sing. If you feel jazzed about a song, whether it's another quartet or a chorus that's singing it, or you heard it on the radio and you say, I, I can see myself singing that song. Sing the songs that you want to sing. And then after you've done that, find the songs that you can sing. I would love to sing Cruella de Vil. That's not how my voice works. My voice is not Eric Dalby's. Most voices aren't Eric Dalby's. Most people shouldn't be singing that song unless her voice is Eric Dalby's. You don't, you won't. My voice isn't built that way. It's too big. I can't be as aerodynamic as Mike Slamka is or as Victor from Lemon Squeezy is. My voice isn't that way. I am not a Ferrari, I am a pickup truck when it comes to lead singing. So recognize the things about your own voice that you can and can't do. I think one of the things that I see most as a judge is a quartet that walks on stage and sings a song that does not fit their voices. They like the song, but those, the song was written for somebody else and it doesn't fit their voices as well. The reason why these quartets are so successful is because they have found arrangers that write for their voices specifically. I know that you know, Paul can do this. I know that Jay can do that. All those things that we admire about those quartets. Yeah, we find the, find the songs that your voice can sing well. And, you know, it's been said that uh, a quartet could walk on stage and sing the polecats and, and still score very high. Well, if they fit the voices, then yeah, yeah, maybe. You have to be able to still expand and be expressive and do all those things, but find the songs that first fit your voice. Number two, develop healthy quartet rehearsal practices. For most people, they don't need reps of songs. You don't need to get there and sing through the songs over and over again. I think if you sung through the songs a couple, two or three times with your quartet, you're probably fine. Most of your quartet rehearsals need to be spent on duets, trios. There are six types of duets, and I don't know however many trios that is. I'm not good at math. But you should be able to step out of the quartet and listen to the lead and the bass and find that match of vowel, that match of resonance, that match of expression, that match of breath plan, all those things that make a uh, match of musicality, all those things that make a good quartet. Then, then have the bass and the baritone sing, or have the lead and the baritone sing. The lead and tenor sing all those things. So find those, find it so those two match, and then get into trios and find that match that you're able to build the ensemble that way. You don't need quartet reps of of mismatched singing that just reinforces uh, a lower level of of execution, which all of your voices are capable of doing quite a bit more than that. So get right to the good stuff right away. Uh, I don't know what it's like over there. It's a little bit scary in terms of COVID over here. So the quartet that I sing in, we've met two times and we are within each other's bubbles. So we are safe in terms of uh, being uh, careful about COVID. And we spent the first, we spent our two rehearsals, I think we sang through a song twice or three times in two hours. And most of it was spent singing phrases two and three people at a time. So I think successful quartets are successful practicers. So develop healthy quartet singing habits. Great, thank you very much. Okay, Amanda has asked, what should the key elements of daily singing practice be? But she doesn't have very long each day. Degunking. I start with degunking. That just do those three things that we talked about. If you have 10 minutes to sing, spend half of it degunking because you could spend 10 minutes singing with gunky vocal folk and that will give you a really 
it won't give you as a fulfilling experience, number one, and you won't be able to achieve as much in terms of high notes or long notes or whatever it is because of that layer of mucus. So get rid of that mucus as much as you can. If you have 10 minutes, yeah, spend a third to half of it getting rid of that mucus. Cool. If you have more than that, <laughs> then still spend 10 minutes getting the junk off your vocal. Let's say you have a half an hour. Um, when I give voice lessons uh, for college students, we would spend 30 minutes to 35 or 40 minutes on technique and only 20 minutes or so on actual repertoire because they can learn repertoire on their own. They can go and learn the notes by themselves. And we, when they came back to my studio, we would talk about you know, expression and, hey, maybe you think about this for this note or hey, you're, this high note, you probably think, remember that technique thing we did here? This is where that applies. And so we would spend you know, half of our time on technique. And so what that, tech think, what that technique thing means is how on every single note of every part of my voice, am I able to achieve expansion? Am I able to achieve clarity? Am I able to achieve vibrancy with less, with the least amount of pressure and, and uh, manipulation possible? So half an hour, 10 minutes, whatever you have, degunk your folds and then find a way to be efficient in your singing on every note, on every vowel and every part of your voice. Great, thank you very much. Okay, Dale has asked, if your falsetto voice seems to have almost disappeared when previously it was very strong, what is the reason and how can you get it back? Well, there are muscles right here in the front of the larynx called cricothyroid muscles, and they are in charge of uh, most of the pitch changes for a voice. So to get our vocal folds to stretch and thin out, these things shorten up and they rock our thyroid cartilage out and down, getting our vocal folds to be stretched. As we get to life experience, also known as as we get older, that joint in there that's rocking is a synovial joint and we can get arthritis in that joint. So if your family uh, has that history of arthritis, uh, at whatever time in your life that that happens, that might be a reason. Number two, it's singing is a use it or lose it situation. Literally the vocal folds atrophy if we don't use them. You see all the time folks that were, you know, using their voice professionally as, as business people in their, in their profession, in their lives, you know, they were strong, they were school teachers or their clergy or law or whatever it was they were doing. They use their voice all the time. And then they retired and didn't use their voice. Well, they're, your voice goes away, it's a muscle. And so if you don't use it, you lose it. Can you get some of it back though is probably some of his question. Yeah, you can get some of it back depending on, on, on the level of atrophy. There are elastin and collagen fibers intermingled with those uh, muscle spindles. And if there's a large amount of atrophy, there's not too much more you can get out uh, of those muscles. You can make it more efficient in terms of the vibratory cycle. You can hydrate yourself up and you can learn to do things in other ways. Uh, but in terms of falsetto, see if you have arthritis, see if you can uh, get a little bit more agility going with your with your voice. Yeah, again, it's a it's a use it or lose it situation. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So a couple more questions for you. By the way, you don't have to just sing with your falsetto. Great. So Jonathan um, has asked, do you know much of primal sound? If so, any thoughts? Oh, I love primal sound, definitely primal sound. In fact, uh, primal sound is an Oren Brown uh, ism, if you want to say that. He was a prominent voice teacher in the early to mid 20th century. I actually got to take a voice lesson with him towards the end of his life, in the beginning of mine. And he taught at a conservatory in Ohio, Oberlin, I think. And he was a phenomenal teacher, really, really wonderful. No, 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 Oberlin, is that right? I can't remember. But he talked a lot about primal sounds. We instinctually make sounds. And a lot of it was kind of talking what I was uh, talking about before, growling and groaning and wailing. Uh, I like to use whining a lot in my instruction. For example, folks that really want to get those high register, whining is the way to do it. Um, I 
I dreamed last night I got on the boat to heaven and by some chance I had brought my dice along. There's not much in that other than just me not doing very much uh, to access those parts of my voice. And so I teach guys to be guys. I teach people just to be whiny to get to those notes. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, I brought my dice along and as I sat. And I heard someone say, say, oh man, save me. Getting that ah, 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 primalness of that, of that, of your uh, phonation into your singing is exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, primal sounds is definitely what I'm talking about. Moaning, moaning, especially for, um, as I'm teaching female singers to sing in that middle part of their voice from about E to, to C above middle C, that middle register, which they love to sing in, but have to sing in all the time, leads and tenors and baritones. Moaning and getting a moan connection to that part of your voice is absolutely how we can sing successfully in that area. Oh, no! Oh! That was a little bit uh, dramatic, but that connection can help you to you know, get more success in that range. I'll probably not let that one down, I'm sure. But that is fantastic. Yes. That will go down in history, Steve, definitely. <laughs> okay, last question that I have at the moment is from Tom. He says, what's your opinion on sucking a candy lozenge fruit gum while singing? It find, he finds it helps him, um, but what about you? What do you think? Sure, uh, anything that you eat or drink will go to your stomach. And so they don't actually get to your vocal folds at all. Yeah, we have two tubes, one goes to the stomach and one goes to the lungs. And the primary job of the vocal folds is to keep anything out of your lungs. That's its primary job, evolutionarily speaking. We have a, also have a cartilage that folds over the top of the airway called an epiglot. It's anytime we eat or drink, stuff goes past the air pipe down into the esophagus. And anytime that we get something down the wrong tube is when this cartilage has not quite covered the hole properly and our vocal folds catch it and expel it. So lozenges, throat sprays, any of that stuff, all they do is go to your stomach. They don't actually help your vocal folds at all, which are lower down here in the windpipe. However, some of those items can help suppress a coughing trigger. Uh, if you're susceptible to that, then that might be something to, it soothes uh, one of those coughing triggers and that's just fine. I'd be careful though that some of those things while you're sucking on that thing can actually strip your natural sal saliva out of your mouth. And so you could end up with a uh, drier mouth uh, right away. So, yeah. Okay, great. So, thank you very yeah. much. Yeah, that's all the questions that I have. So thank you once again, Steve, for coming and joining us this evening. It, as, it's been a brilliant evening and I'm sure everyone watching has enjoyed it as much. So thank you very much. I've had a good time. Thank you for watching. Thank you very much. Hope to see you soon. Thanks again to everybody who's joined in this session and we hope to see you more throughout the month. Take care.